Tere Thank tulemas Tartusse, much. Hillary. Well. Okay, well, thank you for having me. And um, I, uh, I need to start before with a few public announcements. Um, is, now I've met Tanu, is Olev Trass here or somebody who knows Mr. Trass? Was that a squawk? Well, anyway, Lorna and Mart Otz say hello from Tallinn. Now, is um, Jak Vierland here? Or anybody who knows Jak? Oh, well, anyway, Doris Carver, also from Tallinn, says hello to Jak. Right, that's got that over and done with. I swore on a stack of Bibles that I'd say that. So, um, you know, and I'll be in trouble if, I find, you know, if my friends find out that I didn't give the appropriate salutations. Okay, so um, you're probably wondering why I haven't got an Estonian name. And um, this is because I have a very strange life history. And uh, my mother um, was born in Kasmu. She was one of four sisters, and um, not three, four sisters. And she went to Tallinn in the 1940s, and where she was a servant, and I understand rather unhappy. And um, when the war came, um, my mother was actually arrested by the Germans. And, uh, of course, I thought, well, what on earth is this? And when I was tracing my mother, and it took me 20 years, I was told by my family that they'd managed to trace her through her criminal record. Well, criminal record. And then the, the, um, the pastor... Lakla Heinle in London said to me that I wasn't to worry too much about this because it was during the German occupation and probably my mother had just said something rude when she was caught out after curfew. Well, one hopes so. Anyway, the point is she was put to work. Her name was Alisa Maker. And she was put to work um, in the offices of the German army. And she um, introduced to... The cousin that I later met, um, she introduced a man as being, this is the man I love and I'm going to marry. So this is terribly romantic. And um, in fact, when the Germans left, she went with him. And, uh, you know, my aunt Merritt, who I met later, actually gave it most a really quite touching story about the fact that, you know, she stood on, the, on you know, on watch in Tallinn, watching the boat leave. And every time now that I go from... Tallinn to Helsinki. I, I can't help but think of my mother, you know. It's, I'm sure it's his very familiar feeling to everybody here. Anyway, the upshot of it was my mother ended up in, a, in she went to Denmark with the German army and then went to a DP camp in Germany. And then I was conceived, and my German friend um, is very fond of saying, ha ha, you were made in Germany. Um, you know, um, I was conceived in a, in a DP camp in Germany and then sent to... Um, and then my mother came to Britain as part of the Westwood Ho White Swan programme. And you know about this. And, um, you know, which was essentially to import Western Anglo-Saxon Protestants into the United Kingdom, which was a bit depleted, um, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, after the war. And surprisingly, because I've met some of the old ladies who were with my mother in the... Uh, um, my mother was sent to be a cook in a sanatorium in the West Country. And I met some old ladies who said they didn't understand how my mother had managed to come to Britain on the White Swan programme, as it was only open to virgins. Now, my mother, being pregnant with me, was clearly not in the qualifying category. And uh, so, anyway, I was born in the first week of 1948 in a mother and baby home in Bristol. And um, my name was Annalisa Maker. And my mother was, as I say, Alisa Maker. And I was adopted when I was nine weeks old by Harry and M. Bird. So that's how I became Hilary Bird. And then I grew up, and then when after, and I had very, very, very nice British parents. I mean, I, you know, and, and later on when I knew about my 
the personal history of my family, it was really, um, you know, quite scary to think that in 1949, when, you know, the communists came to Kasmu, you know, when all the, the, the captains were sent away, I was one year old and living happily in Bristol. And, you know, and, and I grew up um, always knowing that I was adopted, but it wasn't until I was 18 that my mother, a friend, I wasn't brave enough, said, um, what about Hillary's uh, birth parents? And um, um, my, my adopted mother said, well, um, Hillary's mother was Lithuanian. Well, um, and then there was one of those rather dreadful interludes in one's life when, you know, the, you know, Parents get old, you know, and you're looking after them and you're running backwards and forwards. And then um, nothing happened um, for, until after my parents were dead. And then I decided that I was going to um, seek my birth parents. And um, 20 years ensued. And, you know, what with one thing and another. And, um, and then I, I found... I, the next time I had any meaningful information after I'd got my birth certificate, uh, not my birth, yes, my birth certificate. I was allowed to get my birth certificate, but I already had it. And my birth certificate said, Mother Elisa Maker, which I knew, Grandfather Johannes Maker, Carpenter. But it didn't say what nationality they were. So 20 years went by, and, um, and then, uh, um, as I say... I did various things. I went to various organizations that helped people search for their family. And um, eventually, nothing came of that. And then the, the lady that I was dealing with said, why don't you try, um, why don't you hire a social worker? So I hired a private social worker. I didn't even know there were such things. And a year later, she said, look, Hillary, I'm getting nowhere. <laughs> and so she said, but I've got a friend. And it turned out that the friend was a genealogist. And he found what had happened to my mother within one week. And I, she found my mother, but she was dead. So then I sort of sank into a little slough of despond. And then I suddenly, um, I worked for local government. So I knew a bit about public records and how the system worked. And then I thought, well, hang on. I must have gone through social services. They will be a social services record. So I rang up the social services department in Bristol. And I'm telling you all of this in some detail in case you know people who are actually doing the same thing. You know, and I think my message is just keep at it because it's hard work and it's very emotional work. But it's worth it in the end, as you will see as my story continues. So I, um, I, I had to do a lot of badgering and pestering. But in the end, I got my social services record, which was really quite touching because it said, born. Well, yes. And then, you know, <laughs> and then well cared for. And this is when I was farmed out at nine weeks. And then um, still well cared for. Um, and at nine months, well cared for, two teeth, adoption recommended. And after that, I was officially Hillary Bird. And so, um, um, as I say, and then that was the record that I got. But the most important thing about this record is that it said Mother Estonian in the Latin version. And father, putative father, suspected father, Lithuanian. So it was my father that was probably Lithuanian. Well, my mother should know. And, um, you know, and, um, and after that, because my name was Maker, and because it wasn't Sep, I suppose, or, you know, something, you know, more common, it was quite easy. You know, I'd, I, um, you know, I, um, I uh, was able to get in touch with the you know, the uh, Rachfus Archiv in Tartu. I now live about 15 minutes away from it. And, um, and they wrote back, and after year, two decades in Britain of, oh, are you absolutely sure you want to know you might be rejected? I got 
how to find your lost parents in Estonia. And so I, I don't you know, and they sent me the name of six makers, and I wrote, I contacted all of them, um, and one of whom is actually Silver Maker, who's my first cousin, and um, Troublemaker, as he's known in Estonia, runs in the family. And um, so I, uh, um, you know, I found out that one of the makers um, was my cousin Merica. And I wrote to her, and she wrote back and said, we are quite closely related. My aunt and your mother used to take cows to pasture. I thought, cows to pasture? I was a real city girl. You know, I mean, and, you know, and, um, but, and then Merica said, um, come to Tallinn and meet the family. Um, you know, and she said, well, we can put you up in a hotel, or, you know, you can stay with us. <laughs> and I thought, hmm. Well, I thought, I'd like to stay with Merica and the family, but I thought, I'll only go for a week. They may be family, but I might not like them. So anyway, I went, and I did like them. I liked them very much, and I still like them, and that was in 1998. And, uh, God, 20 years. And, um, and then after that, things just sort of rolled on, and in 2001, I got really, really, really fed up of being made redundant yet again. I was earning plenty of money, and I had a career in local government, blah, blah, blah. I was just completely fed up with the work situation in the United Kingdom. Not my friends, or, you know, or even my adopted family. There aren't many of them left, but they're very nice. Uh, I like them. And so I thought, right, well, if I'm Estonian, I'd better go to Estonia and find out what you know, what, you know what being Estonian's all about, and learn a bit of Estonian and whatever. So I did just that, and I, I you know, I, I, um, I was actually very ill as well, and I collected a lot of money on insurance. So I thought, right, this is it. You know, this is what insurance is supposed to do. You know, allow you to, you know, to spend money on things you like and have a nice life. So I went to. Um, the university, the one in Estonia, where I met some folks here. And, um, you know, and I, for six months, I did a, what I call in my old-fashioned way, a general humanities course. And I liked, and then I followed on with um, a year of learning Estonian. And, um, you know, and I just loved it. And I loved it, you know, I loved tattoo, I loved Estonian for what? God for certain reason, I can't, but, you know, but anyway, be that as it may, I did. And I just stayed, you know, and what became six months in 2002, you know, it's 2015 going on 206, 2016, and I'm still there. <laughs> and, um, you know, and uh, various things then happened. I, I tried to, uh, I was able to cash in a pension because my age f worked for me because I was in my mid-50s. And so, you know, the pension which I was able to cash in enabled me to live very comfortably in Estonia. So, you know, and then I made friends. And I could hear a bit better then, so I could talk a bit more. And... Uh, and uh, since then, I bought my own house, in t or half a house, in Tamalin in uh, 2008. I became involved with various projects. Um, I've written, I've spent the last 10 years um, writing a, uh, an anthology of Estonian literature in English. And I want to save enough time at the end, because I brought two poems with me about Tartu, and they are Gorgeous. Um, one of them is translated by me, and the other one is, is um, written in English by Jan Kaplinski. So, um, you know, and so I, uh, you know, the book is now, I'd rather hoped I could give you a good, you know, could tell you what was happening more, but it's with the University of Indiana. I've had a lot of toing and froing with my literary efforts. Um, I became a, I wrote the Xenophobes Guide to the Estonians. Uh, I say I wrote it because 95% at least is mine, uh, all the silliest parts, that is. And, um, you know, and I can remember when I was writing it, um, what happened? Ulvi Mustmai, who's also credited, um, came up and she said, um, you know, the xenophobes guys are really popular, you know, Selesednes on translaset or something. And, you know, and so um, Ulvi said, 
we could do this about the Estonians, you know. And, uh, and, uh, and then I wrote to the editor at, at Xenophobes, and she said, well, actually, we, I've already tried uh, to do an Estonians, and um, um, I've got a version by Lembit Epic. And, um, but she said, I didn't use it, and I could see why. I mean, it's, you know, it has one or two good jokes. Lembit wrote that wonderful piece about it would be easier to make an Estonian, uh, to make a computer cry than to get an Estonian to express any emotions. <laughs> and um, this is lovely. <laughs> it really made me laugh. And, um, you know, but, um, God, he's a great long, I'm afraid we say in English, streak of piss in Estonian. He's had the most limp handshake but then on the other hand he did get very badly did get, I mean he's an extraordinary man in some ways because he jumped out of a plane and his parachute didn't open so he was really smashed up and then made his way back from being really badly injured anyway that's neither here nor there uh, most of the book is mine and I uh, my experience my outstanding experience and all the fed in stories like the Yuku stories that are in there, and um, you know, and other little, you know, and silly jokes about, you know, um, um, you know, uh, snails are very expensive in Estonia because nobody is fast enough to catch them. You know, this was an Ulvi joke. Don't blame me. And um, so, um, and uh, but Anne, the editor at Zen of Hopes, just kept on saying, they "Can't worship trees," you know. And I sort of said, "Look." Here is a picture of a tree in Narva, covered in ribbons and tea lights. And, and I had to keep telling her that, yes, we still have these old traditions in Estonia. Um, and we actually had, you know, we, we had some quite vicious quarrels. But we're friends now, and, um, you know, and I hope she'll come and see us someday. So she, she was really, you know, it was really tough going, you know, because she just couldn't believe it. She liked trees on, you know, which was, uh, you know, somebody was arrested in Estonia for trying to cut down a tree. And it's a real story, which I got from Postimeg. Anyway, I digress. Now, my, I think I should... So you sort of got the idea that I found my family, went to Estonia, went to get educated, loved it, stayed, created, um, a, a, you know, rather late in my life, this sort of literary career, you know, um, wrote Xenophobes, wrote the anthology. I also worked for the University of Tallinn at what I call the Teacher Training College, which is called something like, I don't know, the... Teacher education seminar facility or something like this these days, you know, and um, and uh, and that is fascinating as well. I won't go into it too much, but it's all about this is doing some wonderful work there as to how to keep teachers in a profession which doesn't pay, and it's really interesting and with some success as far as I can make out. I've also worked for the University of Tallinn. I did uh, some lectures on. <laughs> some Chinese students from Shanghai, um, you know, about uh, Estonian culture. And, you know, I mean, they were, just, they were really sweet, actually. But they did spend their whole time going... <laughs> and, um, and then, they, you know, they, I did two lectures, and the first one was a sort of general introduction about business, culture, education. And then, you know, but when it came to literature and whatever, the boys all disappeared. There I was left with the girls for, you know, the second lot, which was, you know, which was fine. They loved, they liked Lydia, but don't we all? And, um, you know, and uh, so I do bits and pieces. And I've also lectured for the uh, Academy of Arts. And, um, you know, I lectured on Gothic architecture. What else do you lecture on in Tallinn? You know, I mean, and, you know, and I said, I wasn't going to keep people in the, it was a lovely day. And I said, right, that's it, we're going out you know, and then, and of course, when you actually look at it, walking down the street was really interesting because in one side you have the town hall and, you know, you have Olivisteri and, um, you know, and of course it's all, um, it's colonial architecture, it's German architecture. But on the other side, and this is the beauty of going out onto the street and just looking, that over here you have, the, you know, the German stone heritage and then over here in 
the souvenir shop. You have all the sort of wooden cassette and you know, the wall and whatever. And this is the old peasant, Estonian peasant. She comes straight through for, you know, since Lord knows when. It's wonderful. Anyway, so, uh, you know, so I do odds and sods. And I also did a, um, you know, a, a lecture on uh, propaganda. That was fascinating. You know, in the Pats era, the German era, the communist era, and what's come afterwards. <laughs> Some marvellous stuff. And, um, you know, but, and I'm sort of thinking I might, do, I might be Dr. Bird before I kick the bucket and do a, a PhD at the Academy of Arts. And I'm actually very interested in, there was a lovely school in, in interwar Tartu, School of Art, uh, not School of Art, I'm not talking about the, um, the Palace Academy, but there, you know, the pictures that were painted by um, artists that were admirers of the Dutch tradition, Dutch um, interiors. Lovely, sort of, you know, just sort of, really evocative, sort of gentle, soft paintings of people at work and, you know, just ordinary people. Really nice. Anyway, I digress. Now, me and Estonia. Now, I shall talk about this for the next quarter of an hour. And, um, and then you can have a poem or two. And um, now... Well, I was reading my SELU today and uh, reading, um, um, you know, yet another peon of praise for Estonia and IT, which is justified, but I have to say, I'm very old-fashioned. I'm not mega keen, of, for instance, on voting by on, the, on the internet. And, you know, I'm rather, you know, even if the weather is really terrible, I trot along. I like to see somebody sitting there who is checking that I am the person on my ID card. You know, because I'm, I'm really quite sceptical about uh, abuse of the system with, with, you know, through the Internet. So, I, um, you know, I mean, there, Estonia most certainly has had, you know, scored some really huge hits on the international scene with Skype. But again, you see, Skype, the, the software, for, or rather the programming for Skype was put together by Estonians. But it's actually been, what does it belong to now? Um, not Google or eBay or something? Anyway, the point is that Estonians are, are very clever at putting things together, but they're not massively clever at marketing them or managing them. You know, which, which is, I think, is a shame because it means a lot of the wealth and a lot of our talent is just draining from the country. And this touches, brings me on to another subject about, um, you won't get facts and figures from me. I, I do have them, but I mean, this is, this is, this is a, a qualitative, uh, uh, quantitative rather than qualitative talk because it's more interesting that way. And uh, I think. And... Um, the, uh, I was talking about IT, wasn't I? Sorry, folks, senior moment. And um, the economy in general and, you know, uh, factors which affect Estonia's ability to function as a, you know, as a successful state. Um, until recently, the immigration, which is, a, you know, there's a lot of talk about migration backwards and forwards. Until recently, I didn't actually know anybody that had left. And um, I, um, and now within the last year or so, I know my neighbor who was, a, a, you know, trained at Tartu University as a, um, a, um, a She's a chemist, a water engineer. You know, she makes sure that we, what the water that we drink is clean and wholesome. And then she's gone to Germany, where she's head of a laboratory. And then my other friend, it's recently left, is a nurse. Um, you know, trained at, at, uh, at Tartu again, and at the medical school there. And then almost within two years of qualifying, she's gone to Britain, where, of course, she's been snapped up. You know, and, um, and it's, uh, 
this has made me a bit wary, um, you know, because it's also becoming quite clear as time goes on that there aren't enough, you know, services are sort of, you know, it takes longer now to, to get things done. It takes longer to find somebody to fix your tap, you know. Um, it's, um, although having said that, uh, you know, I've had uh, operations for cataracts in Estonia, you know, and it's just, it's just absolutely much, you know, I, um, because I've got an exchange between the UK and Estonia, I didn't have to pay for it, and I had excellent care. And, um, you know, and, um, and also they take good care of me. Mind you, I do, you know, I do go in and they say, because they recognise my name, they say, oh, yes, you're the writer. So I don't know whether or not I get preferential treatment. But, um, you know, um, I came back from London. Um, after I, sold, I eventually sold my house after dithering for about a decade in London and decided, right, that's it, I'm going to Estonia just when Mr. Putin was messing about in the Ukraine. <laughs> I would say, talk about bad timing. Anyway, the thing is, I decided that I was going to pack up and go to Estonia. And um, I came back from London with the most dreadful cough. And I went to the doctor, um, because I actually have to get a new driving license and have a check. And I was hacking away, you know, when the nurse... And I had to see the nurse. And then the nurse said to me, Oh, that's a terrible cough. Why don't you see the doctor? So I said, you know, it was about December the 20th. So I said, oh, all right, then. You know, and, uh, you know, I'm expecting it to be, you know, <laughs> February the 1st or something. And she just... I had to wait 15 minutes and I saw a doctor and then the doctor made an appointment with the lung specialist and then the lung specialist was poking around with her stethoscope on my back and discovered some nasty growth which she didn't like. And then shuffled me along to the skin specialist. <laughs> and so I get rather good care in, in uh, you know, in Estonia. And actually, people are very kind. I mean, you know, in London, I was treated like a piece of meat. You know, and so, I mean, I'm just talking impressionistically now, as I say. I, uh, and, um, and um, you know, but so... I'm okay, but I keep, my friends keep telling me, the friend that's a teacher, the friend, um, you know, who, uh, other friends who work at the hospital, um, you know, another friend who's a fireman, um, you know, my cousin who's a, a you know, my various cousins. Um, the only one that's really thriving runs a string of second-hand shops for charity. And, um, you know, and... Uh, um, you know, she's 30 years old and quite a career woman with this. But it's, um, so it's at the grassroots. It's really, you know, it's very much a mixed bag. I'm okay, but I have lots of friends that are telling me that they're really concerned about Estonia. Um, you know, never mind all the flashy image and the IT stuff and, you know, and, and uh, you know, and the big glassy, glossy tower blocks in Tallinn. Um, as I say, the general impression is that people are getting more and more dissatisfied and now, and that the, the feel-good factor of the singing revolution is wearing off. I think it'll see you this lifetime out. But, uh, you know, I don't know what's coming. And, um, you know, and when I speak to young people, like my cousin uh, Mary, I went to a graduation of my cousin America that I went to stay with in 1998. Her daughter graduated, and I met another cousin there. His son was graduating, and, you know, and they were happy enough. But, um, you know, uh, Mary Lynn, who's 16, America's daughter, said to me, well, um, you know, she just said, you know... Um, on positive. You know, she was really worried by a lack of positive thinking. And, you know, as I say, this is not what turns up in the newspapers or, you know... Um, do you get any of this, Perret? Or Never mind, we'll talk about that later. And um, so, as I say, it's, um, it, it, it's difficult. I, I read the ERR, the public broadcasting newspaper. I try to watch the telly, um, you know, but uh, my hearing is a, you know, bit prohibitive. But I mean, you can't help but notice that, you know, World War Three could break out and, you know, and Estonian, Estonian telly would still be reporting, you know, an opening of a public convenience in Yugovamar or something. <laughs> and, um, <you> know, <laughs> and, um, 
which you know, there's part of me that really likes that. But you know, I do feel isolated from the wide world, and I have to come and have my fix in London, in the UK, or in Canada, or in in in, in the Netherlands, you know, and um, you know, and uh, and I and I, you know, I was telling uh, Tunu before this before I started that I really um, I really miss being able to have a really good argument without quarrelling. You know, and this, of course, is one of the things about Estonia. They've lived in, you know, this, the, 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 the effect of communism is, you know, there's still the heavy hand of the USSR on Estonia. You know, people, they have opinions, you know, a couple of vodkas and they'll come out. But, you know, but people will not do what most people in this room would do, which is just sit down have an exchange of views, maybe even strongly held views, and could still, at the end of the, of, you know, the, end of the conversation, come out of it um, as, fr as friends. And, you know, my friends tend to... I know when they think I'm yapping on like this. They think... You know, I know what my friends do think. Oh, it's Hillary. Ooh. You know, and they just think... You know, they just think I'm crazy. But, you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's... It's very much a... So... I've got my outlet. I mean, one of the, you know, when I started writing for Marlette in like, 2011, um, you know, um, Matty, I, what happened was that I contacted Matty Sombre and he translated Sele said Nad said. Anyway, Matty had, um, Matty, as I say, and then I said to Matty, look, we should do a column together. And he said, yes, we should. And so that's really where I found my voice. And it, I was, you know, I just found, I was staggered. You know, I was really popular. They gave me an award. And when I was writing to a, an article about, um, you know, about uh, Estonian Valley, we have a wonderful valley at the moment, um, uh, you know, for a Canadian, um, um, for... Uh, it had better remain nameless. Something, um, you know, a dance, an international dance newspaper, and um, the, the editor was terribly worried that I was, um, you know, that I was intruding too much on the director of the Estonian National Ballet. Now, this is um, um, Thomas Eder, and he was very famous in Britain when I was in London. He and his wife, um, um, Aggie Ox, who was then Agnes Oaks, and they're complete poppets and we're really good friends you know and sort of uh, you know when I went to the theatre recently and I saw I saw Thomas he comes up and gives me a great big bear hug and you know but the the, the Toronto lady was terribly concerned about you know that I was I was being over familiar with her director well, I got on my high horse and told her that I was an award-winning <laughs> I was an award-winning journalist and so I am, but what I didn't tell her was that the award was a silly picture, a cartoon of myself, which you've seen, Piret, in the entrance, in my Essex in Tartu, and a small ceramic pig with wings, you know, and, <laughs> which is so, which I love, and it's so Estonian, it's beautifully made. And it's a sweet little thing. And it sort of sits in front of me, you know, and, um, and uh, you know, stares at me when I'm writing away. And um, so that was the way I really had my voice. And then I found that when I was having difficulty with trying to get the anthology that I was writing, um, I, I found that I had an outlet for my poetry in the newspaper. And then, uh, you know, all sorts of, you know, Ordinary miracles started to happen, you know, little everyday things. And, um, you know, like I went down to Elba. I have friends at Elba. And, uh, you know, Granny, who lives at Elba, is 90. And, um, you know, doesn't speak a word of English. And I translated Emma Suda. And Granny, who doesn't speak a word of English, was so thrilled by this, she cut it out and stuck it on her wall, you know, and uh, it just made me laugh, you know, and then, and then I was given a huge, I don't know, half a pig or something, you know, and, a, you know, a, a bottle of beer, and that was my reward from Granny. But I did, you know, as I say, I sneaked in quite a lot, and also, you see, I could sneak in my poems, and I could also, uh, my translations, and then I could, and then, and then Matty would help me. 
And because Matty was a really, really good translator. Um, and fortunately, he, he passed away earlier this year. So I'm now, there's now an interregnum. And I've written to, so many people have said, when are you coming back? Which is nice. Um, you know, that I wrote to Marlette and said, you know, do you want me back again? And they said, I wrote to the general editor, and he said, yes, we'll all go away, and, but we have to speak to, um, you know, the, you know, the um, accountant and the articles. Oh, you know, all, you know. <laughs> anyway, that was a couple of weeks, just before I came. So that was two to three weeks ago. So I just thought, oh, off to Canada and just forget about it, you know, and I shall have the result from my American publisher for my big book on the 23rd of October. And I'm also planning to do a book of translation with Doris Karava, you know, who I'm, I've discovered recently, and uh, we really get on, and I, I just think her poetry is absolutely brilliant. I mean, it really is, you know, was a little wonder. And um, so I've, I'm sort of in the waiting room at the moment, so I'm enjoying romping around Canada. And I went to see, I came over to see, I landed, um, I came to Halifax via Reykjavik from London, and then I came to Montreal, and then I got on the train to, um, down to Toronto via Ottawa. My baggage arrived 48 hours later. And, um, you know, and um, just in time for me to have clean clothes for this evening. And um, I, uh, as I say, I, you know, my friends have been taking care of me and showing me the sights, and I'm really looking forward to um, the big, you know, uh, Anybody who's anybody will be there. My friend Kylie's wedding on Friday. And, um, and even written a special ditty, which I'm not going to read here. But we've got about a quarter of an hour. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read you my tattoo poems. And then, Pirat, if you'd ask anybody if they want to, I, I need your help on this. But um, these are my tattoo poems. Now, the first one is translated by me. And it's by Ernst Enno, and he lived from 1875 to 1934. He was a school inspector, and he wrote some charming stories, um, you know, uh, uh, for children. And, um, you know, things like the grasshopper goes a-walking, and it's written in sort of... It, it's lovely. And this, at Tartu College, is On a White Night in Tartu. Tartu Valgal how lovely, lovely is Tartu on a white night. Windows ashine with warm northern beams, full of happiness and secret dreams. In the sky, only clouds and a star in sight. The Emayoki River prattles by in a sweep. Somewhere, someplace, oak leaves seem to weep. Over the roofs, rattling traffic is heard, arriving in waves to a listener's ear. And greenery here and greenery there, a far-off song across water in air. Among the fields, among the land, the silent spires thy thinking, side by side, sparkling and winking. How you dream, you dream as night fades, as night grows. Into the netherworld, busy day fades. Night reveries rustles among the shades, and networks hum like living rainbows. It's so, so hard to think dark thoughts or fears, to be miserable or shed tears and suck on melancholy mother's milk. Women whisper kind words from ear into ear, and chains clink here and chains clink there. And from the backwards, sad cries so clear, and around the graves, around the land, between the farms, earth and sand, still awaits the gathering darkness. All await the gathering darkness. How lovely you are, Tartu, on a white night. Look in a bay window, see a flame fold. Nearby a second, a third shines like gold. Young life returns home from cold and blight. Springs in the air, pressing all to her breast. Into our courtyards we step out with zest. To our rows of fruit, delicious and sweet, reviving all who pluck them and eat. And magpites... Sorry. And the light here, and the light there, and from the backwoods, joy cries, joyful cries so clear, and all around the farms, the lands sparkle, guarding sky, earth, and sand. I love her instead of. How lovely you are, Tartu, on a white night. Snow-like trees flutter and shower. This is your coronation hour. 
Oh, joy to be home when it springs so bright, to drink the North Night's golden soul, to kiss in depth the homeland soil, to feel stone shards fall from a ridge, to the home of your soul to build a bridge, and the light here and the light there, and the mother tongue everywhere, and around the fields, around the land, all is well, so good to see, smiling, living tenderly. So that's Ernst Denner. And then the second poem is actually written in English by Jan Kaplinsky. And this is I Am the Spring in Tartu, from I Am the Spring in Tartu collection. And this was written in English and written in 1991. I am the spring in Tartu, the spring at the riverside. Last ice gone, last patches of snow, not yet melted, here and there in the ravines. Skylarks chilling overhead reminding you of something blue and open, full of wind, full of scents, comings and goings, ducks and water hens shrieking in water that is silently rising day by day, overflowing the willow bushes and coming nearer and nearer to our garden and our house. I am the spring in Tartu, the spring of my boyhood, young grass coming forth on salts, frogs fornicating ponds and peaked it's young people procreating on dryer hillocks, voyeurs with binoculars, and magpies who have laid their first eggs looking at them, and the spring sun, moist and clear, shining at them, and as it rises higher and higher, melting them all into the twinkling mosaic of waters hurrying downwards, carrying downstream our memories, our lives and childhoods, leaving no trace in the old red sandstone we are grown on and buried into. The last reminder of an ancient red continent washed away little by little by great red rivers into the shallow warm seas of Devon, full of strange fish, shibolites and scorpions, who sometimes died a natural death and left their traces in the place where our house stands, on a little red rock in the flow of time. But I am the spring. I am the spring in Tartu. Isn't it wonderful? So there we go, Pirret if you'd like. And, um, you know, and if anybody would like to ask me about my strange and wonderful life in Tartu. Yeah, that's it. Right, where's the beer? Oh. <laughs> so I'll, I'll give a mic, then we we'll, can record the questions. Okay. Since, since you read Ernst Denno's poem, I'm just wondering if you knew his granddaughter or you've met her, Elin. Help. <laughs> Elidona, because she, she had a sim I, I understand. She had a similar historical background as you, because her mother was also uh, the white uh, swan, Valget Luiget, okay. and it grew up in England. The question was, do you know Ernst Denner's daughter? Oh, Elidona, good Lord, no. Elidona, living, she, she used to live in England. Not anymore. Ernst Denno's daughter? No, I don't, I'm afraid. Her granddaughter, and who has also written uh, a book that's doing quite well now, Into Exile. We have to give the, the book because we have copies of Ellen, Ellen books here. Please. They both have lived in England, actually. Well, the problem is, you see, that I didn't actually meet the Estonian. Because I didn't grow up in the Valley Zestlaset community, well, I didn't actually yeah. meet the English Estonian. Well, Ernst Denno just had a 100th anniversary or some, some big anniversary this summer. She was in Estonia uh, dedicating a chair to him in Hopsalo. So, I, you know, maybe you've kind of come across her that way. celebration of er Ernst Denner's birthday in Estonia this summer and the granddaughter was also joining the celebrations but you probably No, you see then. again because I'm very deaf I don't actually tend to go to public meetings. And I, you see, I'm not really plugged into the mainstream because, you know, the Estonian Literary Informa Information Centre actually has its own translators and its own events. But because I just go there and see somebody going... I, I tend to give it a miss. So I'm not very plugged in to, you know, the Estonian communities. I mean, I, I, obviously, I have my friends and, you know, in Tartu. But, um, you know, and I've recently started to link in to journalists, poets and playwrights, which is nice, you know. But, um, you know, otherwise, I'm a bit, bit of a loner, really. But uh, do give the lady the poem. I, I think, did I do... 
I did another one by Ernst Enno. I'll give it to you, and then you, you can give it to her and, and see what she thinks of it. All oh, criticism is very welcome, by the way. Um, and, uh, you know, but uh, I'm, I am rather a fan of Ernst Enno. And I thought I'd choose those two poems, because, of course, Ernst Enno was writing during the, um, the Republic, and uh, Kaplinsky was very much part of the, you know, the, 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 the sort of... Uh, you know, uh, very much part of the resistance to the, the Soviet regime. And um, so it's nice to see the counterweight between those two, because the feeling is the same when all said and done. And, um, well, maybe not frogs fornicating, you wouldn't get Ernst talking about that, but, you know, um, you know I mean, it's all fairly innocuous. Um, you know, <laughs> so, um, you know, and, um, and I rang Jan Kaplinsky. Uh, well, I didn't ring, what am I saying? I sent him an email. Uh, phones are a big no-no for me. And, um, <laughs> and I wrote to him and said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm writing an anthology and I'd like to use Verse and Gitterick said, and also I am the spring in Tartu. You know, uh, this, and he wrote back and he was so sweet and said, how nice of you to take an interest in my old poems. And I thought, well, you know, a good poem is eternal, sort of thing, you know. And, um, and he said, I don't really like Verse and Gitterick said. And I said, well, I don't really like Verse and Gitterick said, you know. I mean, it's a, it's a good poem, but, you know, there's been a lot of... There's been a lot read into it, and I do agree, for what it's worth, I mean, it was very gra gratifying to know that the author felt the same as I did, but he... Um, <coughs> You know, he, um, uh, the reason I chose it is because it's well known and because this book is actually written for people like, you know, for um, people of Estonian extraction who are rather losing their Estonian, hopefully to draw them back in. And, um, you know, and um, Versen Getterich said there's been a lot of articles and, and uh, you know, commentary, critiques, um, you know, analysis in the various English language. Uh, you know, newspaper, uh, you know, journals and, um, you know, whatever, and on, on, on the internet too. So I thought, I have to use that one because it would cause ripples. And, um, you know, so... Um, and, um, and also the choices I made for this book were uh, actually... It's annotated so that when you go to, for instance... Um, Mary Under, and you read that Under was a, a member of a group called the Sieru. I've actually, in the Kalevi Poig bit, in the Kreuzfeld bit, extracted from the um, from Kalevi Poig the you know the, the 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 story that's told by um, I don't know Olev or Sulev on the night before a battle, um, you know about this wonderful blue bird, the Sierra bird, and and then you see it makes complete sense, you and you know that this bird is she's not the bluebird of happiness. She's huge for a kickoff, and um, you know and she flies past the mansion of the moon, past the citadel of the sun, past the little gate of copper. And the little gate of copper is the gate between Asia and Asia Minor, which on the Day of Judgment will be opened up and all the Finno-Ugrian hordes will come rushing in. And so this is really rather wonderful. It took me years to pin that down, what the little gate of copper was. Years. So, you know, um, so I'm hoping Slavica will publish the book. They've always been, um, they are a, a publishing, they're a press for um, Indiana University. They're one of the printing houses for Indiana University. So it's, you know, we're talking here of a place, Bloomington, with a really good reputation. Aunt Oras work there, um, Felix Venus, you know. So it's, uh, I'm, you know, Say a little prayer for whatever gods you have, you know, because I, I really want this book published. A lot, of, a lot of work went into it. And I really think that it will help people understand us a lot more because of the annotations. You know, like, say, for Rehepap, um, you know, the, what really... I, I've made a big issue in the book about the fact that, you know, a lot is talked about how grateful Estonians should be to the Baltic Germans. Well, so we should, because they codified the language and, um, you know, they introduced 
romanticism, romantic nationalism, all of which was, was a big impact. But at the end of the day, when Estonians when the books were codified and, uh, you know, the Estonians had actually seen for themselves, well, you know, what their own heritage was worth, that's what they did. It's very subversive. You know, I mean, they didn't write... I mean, it wasn't as if, you know... German mythology was adopted, you know, the, 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 you know, the Estonian um, national uh, epic is not the Nibelungenlied, uh, I apologise to anybody about my German, it's not very good, it is actually Kalevipoig, and it, the Kalevipoig is full of wonderful things, it's also full of rather awful things, I mean, Kalevipoig is, is dim in the extreme, you know, and of course, in, but then, I mean, Kreuzfeld had to tidy him up. He was the most awful critter in the, in the original um, mythology. Rapist and, you know, Lord knows what. And the original story um, had uh, Kalevi Poig um, so badly behaved and, you know, really abusing women left, right and centre that he was told off by an angel and then kept on behaving badly. And in the end, the angel picks the picks Kalevi Poig up by his testicles and chucks him in a swamp where he's last seen waving gaily. I mean, how Estonian can you get? You know, and, and uh, I rather do, you know, I, I'm on rather a bit of a crusade against all of this, um, you know, Estonians are, are rather just a copy, a second-class door German because you know, it, there are elements of doorness, of course there are, you know, the the you know, um, but, uh, you know, there are some really, really wicked things in, <laughs> in Estonian literature. And I'll finish off, actually, uh, by an hour, Pirette. Is that all right? I'll finish off by just saying that, that uh, reminding people that who is the most popular um, writer in Estonia today. And, of course, it's Andros Kivirach. And what's the best-selling book? Rehepab. Now, in my book, I've actually told the story of Rehepab um, as told by Kunda, the original when it was collected in the, the 19th century. But Rehepab, um, it's full of, you know, of, well, full of Rehepab, you know, uh, which there's some translators, Old Barney, which I don't really like, because, sure, it's the old barnkeeper, I mean, it's just like, some translations are just wacky. I mean, um, what was the Lutz translation of, um, look, it's a maze, horny. <laughs> you can't use horny, you know, and, um, you know, and um, so then some wit came up with bumpy. I just call it the little imp. Which is what he is, you know. And, um, and um, anyway, I digress. Just to finish off, my last word on Estonian literature after 10 years of hard slog. Um, uh, that the most popular book still is just full of old barn keepers, cavalants, the old witch and her cat. You know, um, assorted devils, Nas, you know, the, the, the German baron, and, you know, and, and, and then a rather, you know, some really sort of stiff-necked, slick-talking lawyer. You know, it's, it's full of all the old characters from, from Estonian literature. Estonian literature, not German literature, or, you know, or whatever. And it's, it's um, and sure, this, you know, we, this, I say Estonian literature, but it was what, Kreuzfeld, who wrote the, um, you know, the, uh, you know, the Estonian tales, he insisted it was rachfasust. So it really is from the mouth of the people. And, the, and again, the glory of going back to the original Kreuzfeld was that what Kreuzfeld heard in his studio was not, all right, it, it was not exclusively Estonian, but the tales that were told in the storybooks, which he tells us really touchingly, were passed around from person to person and read so much until they just fell apart. And, you know, and those stories come from all over the world. You have Aesop, 
who um, Martin Luther thought of second only in usefulness for its moral um, lessons um, as to um, the Bible. And then there's the most amazing things pop up in these 18th century uh, um, books. I mean, I, I just... Lorna, my friend Lorna, the playwright, just said, oh, nothing happened before Coidula, you know, and then I sort of went and looked at these storybooks, and they really are full of the most amazing stories. You can probably tell folks I love a story myself. And, um, you know, and... Um, you know, and there's a story... Uh, you know, there's, there's a story from the Decameron by Boccaccio. I mean, who, you know, um, there's, there are stories. There's a story from an English, a new statesman, I think, about, would you believe it, a Native American and a, and a, and a white colonist. Uh, and, you know, and there's, there's bits of Petrarch. So, you know, and, and of course, the amazing thing is that although... That, Unlike even um, Germany, France, or Britain, a very, very high percentage of Estonians could read these storybooks. But they had, but that was all they had, you see. That and the Bible. You know, the French and the English had, you know, the Dutch had newspapers, um, you know, but um, here in Estonia we just had um, we just had the storybooks. Except down south, where um, a, uh, an Estonian coster um, translated, would you believe it, John Bunyan's Pilgrim Progress from the German in about 1768. I got so many hits in my Mahler article on that. And everybody sort of, you know, because Estonians do like their books. You know, even, you know, uh, whether I'm in London or whether I, you know, or whether I'm in... Estonia itself, or whether I'm in Canada, you know, you can always usually de uh, depend on an Estonian to have, a, you know, at least one bookshelf stuffed full, you know, and, um, and it's a real phenomenon. And with that praise for Estonian literacy and, uh, and uh, uh, literature, I'm going to finish. Now, aha! It's Tom. Is that Tanu? <laughs> Oh, it's for the recording very well. Um, I have a translation question for you. Um, Estonian is my first language, English is second. I've made maybe a pittance in translating things. But for me, poetry is the most difficult thing to translate. It's also and, the most wonderful thing to but translate. You, but you, are, uh, you made reference to Emma Suta, and uh, is it possible it's Ten years we've been electronically corresponding, and when you sent me your translation of Emma Suda, which I think is powerful translation, you've got the sense what the poet wanted, you've got the meter, you've got the rhyme. How do you do that? Because as I say, I try to translate, and I've got zillions of dictionaries and, and, and uh, well, I'll options, tell you, it's but interesting I, I find it so difficult. So how, what's your secret? I don't know how I do it, is the answer. And, you know, and because I, um, I just have a gift for it. Um, I read, um, I, I, you know, as I said, um, I've been doing some work with Doris Carver. And, um, you know, Doris asked me the same question. So did Lorna. Lorna Ott. So I said, well, I don't know, just can. <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, I mean, it's the same way I could say to Lorna, how come you write plays, or Doris, how come you write poetry? I just do, you know, I just enjoy and seem to produce some really popular translation. And, you know, the thing is, with I find, for instance, with Lydia, I mean, she's, uh, you know, I mean, it's just, there is so much musicality. And, um, and I love music. Maybe this is something to do with it. I listen to a lot of music. I'm as deaf as a bloody post, but, you know, I do like music. Um, and, um, you know, but, um, you know, Coidula is like, you know, is like music. Enno is like, you know, just like a, a musical piece. You know, um, Deborah Varandi, the Soviet poetess, wonderful, Lidza Dathyad. There's, you know, simple things. Kirsty Merilas, sweets for the men. Enno, 
um, you know, all of it, wonderful, rolling, lyrical poetry. It's fabulous stuff. And I just don't know, maybe it's in my blood. Uh, you know, I, I can't explain it. And, you know, but I did read um, an article by somebody at Tallinn um, University about translating poetry. And, um, well, I just waded my way through about six page of pompous treacle and then came across a competent, but no more than that, five out of ten translation at the end. And it was Carver, actually. It was a Carver poem. And, um, you know, and, uh, well, you know, <laughs> one, one, that, one that I had translated myself, and I just... I just thought, you know, in Britain, sometimes people say, um, you know, rather unkindly, those who can do and those who cannot teach. And I feel rather like that because I, I just feel I can do. And I can't really explain it any better than that. It's just that I love it, of course. So it's a labour of love. Um, you know, and I've done it without wages for 10 years. <laughs> and, um, you know, and I've been fortunate, fortunate that I've been able to be in a position where I, I can afford, it because of my pensions, to do, you know, what I've wanted to do. And, um, and of course, the more you do, the more you get used to it. And, um, and, of course, I've always... Another thing is, I think, Tanu, that might be a bit of a clue to it. I've always, be, I, you know, I spoke about the Estonian love of books, which I think is palpable. And... Um, you know, even my modern cousins, who sort of are always, you know, uh, really, uh, you know, are, um, you know, still read books and are interested in books. Uh, but I've always read a lot of books, and my vocabulary is huge. And I think that helps. Having said that, and here's a tip for all would-be translators, there are... On the internet, again, this is how to put your new technology to good use, you can get a dictionary, a very good dictionary for free. You can get a thesaurus, which will give you, you know, alternatives to a word you're looking for. And you can also get a rhyming dictionary. So there's an element of cheating, Tonu, when it comes to rhyme. But, um, you know, but I mean, I, I, and also, I, my translations are very free. You know, like the opening line of the return of spring, you know, cordula, you know, your reign is over, winter king. Welcome, welcome, welcome spring, you know. And I mean, it's just welcome spring, but, you know, chuck in a few welcomes. And, you know, and there you have it, and you have the sense of it, you see. And, it, and I really got that tip from a German friend who apart from, you know, you know um, who said, and I said, she translates from German into Estonian. And I said, well, look, how do you manage, you know, and she found it easier than myself as a native English speaker because, you know, um, in German as well, everything is, is a bit higgledy-piggledy, you know, all, all over the place in a sentence. You know, you start a sentence in Estonia, in Estonian, and I've learned this the hard way, and then all of a sudden it sort of drifts off somewhere else and then comes back at the end as a sort of coda in a ballet or a piece of music. And... Um, um, so, as I say, my German friend said uh, that what she did was, she, and the tip she gave me was, read to the end, you know, extract all the bits and pieces, which are all one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then just reassemble them at the end. And that was a really good tip. You know, I mean, uh, because instead of, because the Estonian mind, the Finno-Ugric mind, you know, actually doesn't, there's very little history of Aristotle. In fact, there's resistance to Aristotle, even at the University of Tartu, uh, you know, in terms of philosophy. And, you know, uh, the, the Aristotle we take for granted, Aristotle means one comes after two, two comes after three, and, you know, this doesn't, this is not the only way to think. And, um, you know, and, um, you know, this is why in, um, uh, 
you know, you can give an impression of how valuable something is by saying, for instance, the cup was golden. And then you'll come in to the second line and it will say, the cup is silver. And you think, I thought the cup was golden, you know, but it doesn't matter, you see, because it's both gold and silver are precious. And the object of the exercise is to actually give it this, this impression of, of um, preciousness. And, you know, once you actually start thinking along those lines, then it's, you know, you, it's just really rather wild and wonderful. It's terribly liberating. You know, the old, you know, the old brain box gets going in all sorts of directions. Recommended. And, um, you know, so, yes, that's it. So, but at the end of the day, it's still a bit of a mystery to know. I don't know how I do it. And, um, and, uh, but as I say, there are aids on the internet if people are trying. But even then, you have to get the rhythm. And, you know, and, uh, um, you know, Lorna used to call me her reem set. You know, her rhyme smith, which I rather liked. And, um, you know, and, uh, and as I say, I, I, um, and it's really interesting to work with living authors as well. I translated um, um, Lorna's Coigulaveri. And then with Doris, Doris Carver, I did um, the quartet of poems that she wrote for her father, whose name was Hilar Carver, the musician. Doris actually does a lot of work with music anyway. You know, she sets, uh, you know, she writes librettos and things. So she is very directly involved with music. But I, I think, again, it's, I think music, to come back to where I started after a good old Finno Greek ramble, um, is um, I think that the musicality is important. And of course, it all fits in, doesn't it? You know, choirs, brass bands, song festivals, you know, um, a, a really. A, a really amazing, actually, um, record for uh, poetry and song. I mean, when I mean Doris Carver's Mandragora went straight to the top of the best-selling list in 2002. Can you imagine a Canadian poet? Not even Margaret Atwood has managed that. You know, I mean, let alone in Britain. You know, you don't, you simply don't get poetry books in best-selling lists. You know, you get some pretty you know, there are some pretty good poetry books, but, you know, they, you know, but not, not this uh, embracing of poetry you know, at a popular level, is what I'm trying to say. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So that's it, really. I mean, and this, this is, um, you know, uh, it, it's just been, a, all I can say is that this... Uh, Dealing with Estonian literature has been a hugely enjoyable experience. And again, I can't really explain why. I just love it. You know, and, uh, and you know, what better reason for sort of working at it than, you know, to work with something you love for God's sake. I've worked for 30 years in local government. I had a good career, you know, and did, you know, and did my best to write the world. And, um, you know, and, um, you know, and to do the right thing. And, and, and now I just feel, I just feel released, actually. You know, and um, let the world go its own way. You know, I haven't got that much longer. So, I mean, they'll, um, you know, so it's just a question of the horses for courses. And, um, yeah, that's about it, really. But, I, I, you know, as I say, I'm not really in the mainstream of... of um, of the Estonian literary establishment, but um, you know, they, but they know about me, and you know, they think I'm crazy. But you know, I just carry on anyway. <laughs> and, and that, and, and you know, and uh, is, d is there any more questions? Yeah, yeah, can. I might have trouble. It's a female. <laughs> so all the top half of my hearing is gone. So I can hear Tunu, but I can't hear this lady. Okay. I have a question that you, you briefly mentioned that you are a bit concerned about uh, the Estonians leaving the country. Yeah, yeah. But what, what, why do you, or what do you think that will encourage people to stay in the country? Or what do you think are the be best aspects that would encourage people? Sorry. So what do you think are some of the 
the things that encourage people to stay in Estonia, or how uh, would you encourage people to stay in Estonia? That's an interesting question. And, and actually, I was involved in, um, you know, in, with social science for many years. And, you know, the part of me that's still tied into my old profession watches that one with, with interest. And the answer is... Uh, uh, Mm. I'm afraid it's rather gloomy because, you know, the fact is that what young people want is a good salary. I mean, if I tell you that my friend, the nurse, earned um, about £500 doing two jobs, you know, one in Elva and one in Tartu, and then you know, she's taking home two, almost three times that much in the United Kingdom. You know, and, and the fact is, Estonia can't afford to... Um, or the, the Estonian state can't afford higher wages for public servants. Um, what the companies are doing, um, you know, because most of our large companies, the banks, the breweries, the, the food, the people that make, you know, manufacture food, the people that do the logging, um, a lot of the building com companies are all owned by Scandinavians. Um, but even so, the fact is that Estonia is, without doubt, um, you know, uh, um, a source of cheap labour for these companies. So, you know, and, and um, you know, there's, there's not the wherewithal in Estonia to... Um, um, well, there are no trade unions. Now, I'm not suggesting that everybody in Estonia should go out and join a trade union, but the fact is, collective bargaining in Sweden is done by trade unions who have a very... You, you don't need to be the sort of trade union that they had in, in, in the, the Soviet time. But the principle of collective bargaining is important. And, um, you know, and... Uh, um, in Sweden, 80% of people belong to a, a trade union. And they are able to talk with the government at an institutional level and to actually come to some agreement about wages. Having said that, there is another factor altogether, which is, in my opinion, and this is very much, again, the loose cannon opinion, the fact is that Estonia isn't fully yet a money economy. People still do a lot. I mean, say, for instance, 20% of food grown in Estonia um, is, um, uh, you know, is grown by people on allotments, either in the, you know, in the city in, or on, you know, on their little homesteads or their family homesteads in the country. Um, there is a lot, and I do this myself, there is a lot of barter. You know, if you dig my garden, you know, I, uh, you know I'll... Um, well me and the neighbours. I don't do a thing to my rather large garden around our house and, and my neighbours are all there sort of digging away and Auntie is the fireman is there sawing away on the, the trees, you know, the, in spring. And I do their translation, for instance, and, you know, and, uh, you know, and the children are quite free to come in and, you know, and watch my television because I've got 40 channels or something, and they've only got three, you know, and um, so this is, you know, this is, and I do things like I pay for the, um, our, our rubbish, our trash to be removed, which cost me all of something like five euros a month, you know, or something silly like this. So that's, a, that's barter, and, you know, and, uh, you know, like when I wanted somebody to look after my cat when I was away in the spring, um, you know, my, my friend, um, uh, you know, I do... She's a doctor. Um, she was the one that sent the text. And, um, you know, when she needs um, uh, English language skills, she asks me. And there's a lot of this, you know, that goes on in Estonia, which, which is just lost. I mean, you just, you just don't do it, in, certainly in London. 
you know, in, in really sort of um, advanced capitalist societies. So I think that there's, um, um, you know, I, I, I think that this isn't taken into account when people start panicking. You know, and uh, because there is this fiction that, you know, somehow or other we are not an Eastern European nation and that we are somehow, you know, uh, uh, you know um, a fully developed Scandinavian country. Now, I actually do think my own personal opinion is that Estonia is a part of Scandinavia. You know, if you do the sort of work which I've been doing and then you look at the sort of, you know, the folk tales and all this and the culture and all this sort of thing, so much of it is tied into, you know, Scandinavian costumes, Scandinavian food. Uh, you know, a lot of the terms, for instance, in Estonian cookbooks are, are actually Swedish because the first Estonian cookbook was translated in about 17... 80, I think, and it was translated from Swedish, so that's why, you know, um, there's a lot of Swedish terms. But, I mean, it's just generally... It, Estonia feels much more like Scandinavia, you know. I, I can't, uh, you know, but it's but we're the poor relation, you see. And, and, and um, you know, well, you know, it'll come. I mean, it's, it's good to think that, you know, that we, we have this... Uh, um, I mean, the Finns have been really good, I think, to Estonia, if we're honest about it, you know. And, um, you know, and I know there's all these... You know, my cousins are very fond of telling jokes about drunken Finns in Tallinn, you know, and about, uh, you know, the, mar the marvellous thing I put in the book about, you know, it was from, I think, from cousin Marcus, who said, um, you know, that, uh, you know, Finnish is like listening to Estonian spoken by a drunken man. And, uh, you know, and, but, I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> I mean, and again, if you follow the, all the, lit you know, the, the connection between um, Finnish literature and Estonian literature, it's just, you know, uh, the Finnish connection is massively important. I mean, you know, even... Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting away from the social thing again and on to my... Um, so the answer is I don't really know. What I would reply to your question is that it is a damn sight more complicated than gets into the newspapers. As I say, it's not necessarily... Let's talk about the black economy, but there's a perfectly legitimate economy of exchange which goes on all day, every day, at a sort of you-and-me type level, which is not taken into account. And, you know, it's not taken into account because it's lost. In you know certainly in the United Kingdom and probably here, but um, what the government can do? I mean, we get a lot of preaching and finger wagging, which nobody takes any notice of. Does anybody? You know, and um, you know, uh, and um, you know, and then every now and then there was this um, oh. Welcome talent home or something. Well, it, I mean, frankly, it's not working. But I mean, there's a certain body of people, well, probably like myself, you know, who just won't leave Estonia because they're home bodies. You know, and there's, there's, you know, and there'll always be enough people to sustain that. And, you know, and the home bodies have a bit of help from their friends. You know, from Valley Thetlaset, from Scandinavia. Um, you know, it's, 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 we're all right. We're pegging on. You know, we're not... Um, you know, as I say, I, I get fed up with all the sort of, look at us, aren't we? we're a shining star and all that nonsense. Because, uh, you know, I just think... We're doing okay. We're, we're pretty solid, really. Well, you know, we've got the, the Swedes in charge of the money. Um, you know, it, that keeps... You know, we've got, we're in NATO. You know, um, quite what they do if Growdy Bear decides they're coming. God alone knows. But, you know, um, I mean, now Mr Putin's getting involved with things elsewhere. Uh, you know, he might stop looking, looking at us. But... Um, you see, and that doesn't help talking about, you know, people leaving. I mean, because it was very, very, very scary when Putin went into the Ukraine. I know this isn't a direct response to your question, but it is worth knowing. The night I wrote in the Xenophobes um, um, that... Um, 
the Estonians are always turning the telly on every five minutes to make sure there's no invader on the road. Well, blow me. There I was the night, you know, I heard the news from the Ukraine rushing in, turning the telly on, you know, and, uh, and uh, you know, and Tartu just went deathly quiet. You know, and, um, you know, and, um, you know, the... You know, where I live in Tamerlane, it has this sort of rather old-fashioned street lamps, you know, with a sort of rather dim glow. And uh, there was nobody, absolutely nobody on the street. Everybody was huddled indoors, tense and waiting. Sophie Ox... Sorry, literature again. Read Sophie Oxen and Purge. It's just like that. You're just waiting for something to happen. And it doesn't help. And there's nothing any government can do that's going to pick us up from next door to, you know, uh, some rather un unpleasant neighbours and plop us down in Luxembourg. And, um, you know, and, uh, you know, you just have to learn to live with it. I mean, I'm lucky because, I mean, I'm buying a bolt hole in Wales. I mean, and let's face it, everybody, I mean, the bugger's not going to get as far as as Wales, let alone Toronto, you know, so, um, you know, but there is that, and there's nothing that anybody can do about that. And, um, and I do try and be optimistic, but, I, 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 but as I say, the most positive thing I can say is to come back to the fact that there's, I don't think there's a real understanding of how Estonia is just a half-money economy. I think, you know, the barter business is important and I think it's much more important than the so-called black economy you know um, uh, although I understand that the black economy is I, I mean well you can't really uh, because simply be, I, I, I suppose it's terribly ideologically unsound to call it the black economy I don't quite I mean the shadow economy what would you call it I don't know, but you know what I mean you know when people work for cash and you know they take cash in hand rather than have a contract and, um, of course, having said that, I'm having an extension to my garage built with cash in hand. And, um, you know, so, um, you know, it's, uh, it's complicated, is all I have to say. But just don't read everything you read in all this cheerful Charlie press. But on the other hand, don't believe the nonsense about, oh, everything in Estonia is dire and miserable, because it isn't true. It's somewhere in between, and it's complicated. And, you know, and, and uh, you know, and, uh, and things are shifting and moving, but in ways which are difficult to define. I mean, I would say, for instance, you know, and this is about 10, you know, a decade in the restored republic. I actually think people are a lot more cheerful than they were when I went. I mean, they're still not. Canadian cheerful, but you know, they are, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, um, you know, when I went to my friend Matty Sumray, the translator, when I went to his funeral, I mean, his sons were very, you know, were, you know, even at a funeral, they were cheerful. And, um, you know, and I notice that manners are getting better, you know, you don't have that sort of, uh, you know, that com completely grumpy, um, you know, I mean, oh, mind you, when I go to the hospital, you know, I've been to the hospital with this, this cataract problem, I always manage to get Miss USSR 1957. <laughs> she is a old baggage. You know, and you know, you go up with your little ticket, you know, and then she's just, you know, and then there's a sort of, you know, and then off she goes to the the, to the archives, come back and you know, and then it's, you know, you think, oh, they say, thanks a lot, have a nice day. Well, I do, and um, you know, so but it's uh, but it that is passing. I mean, even you know, even if Estonians aren't talkative and you know, they they don't do much of have a nice day, but you know, I mean, they the people will actually, you know, they're just nicer, you know, the really old Soviet manners are just. <sighs> quite something and um, yes that's it and uh, you know so I, I, I think my own personal you know hands on just totally personal reaction is that Estonia is softening up and uh, you know and for 
God's sake, what can you expect? It wasn't just the, I mean, you know, the Soviet era. I mean, you know, Constantine Patz wasn't exactly a barrel of laughs. And then, you know, and then, you know, and then you have those centuries of those awful Baltic Germans. You know, and, uh, you know, and then you open a book, you know, and then there's rather an admiration for the Baltic Germans in, in you know, in, you know, because they were, they were treated so badly by the Soviets. Well, frankly, I mean, you know, the things you read, I mean, if you've ploughed through Estonian history like I have, I mean, you just come across abuse after abuse after abuse. And, of course, there were some good Germans. There always are, you know, the ones that, you know, that were... Um, uh, you know, the ones that taught the Estonians to read. But only because, in the 19th century, but only... A lot of the time, they were just trying to just start another crusade and, you know, having for the last 700 years desperately tried to make good Christians of the Estonians, you know, they, you know, they, 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 um, you know, they, they then decided maybe it was a bit of a time for a bit of a soft sell, you know, so let's teach them to read and write. And... Um, but, um, I mean, and, you know, the last thing I read really quite recently was about, uh, and this is way back in the 14th century, when um, if, a, if a serf escaped to the city for a year and a day, um, they, ha they were entitled to their freedom. This was a, a civil right, one of the very, probably the only one that an Estonian serf had. And um, the, um, the baron came to town caught this poor man, it was winter, he tied him up to a tree. Well, this, you know, he reclaimed him, tied him to a tree. This poor man lingered on for about a day and was still, you know, alive when the Baron came back. And after being out in one of our minus 18 snowy nights, you know. And then the poor man's legs were frozen, so your baron takes a stick and knocks them off. And we know about this because for once the city of Tallinn did actually take, did actually execute the baron. You know, it's about the one time when there was justice done. It, admittedly quite crude, but you know, uh, but I mean, and it's stories like this which I just kept coming across again and again and again. You know, and you know, and even Vilda, going back to the literature, um, you know, how I had my first stripes. I thought, oh, he's talking about his striped tabby cat. No, well, not not a bit of it. He was actually the whipping boy for some German baron's son. You know, and when the when the son misbehaved, Vilda was beaten, and the stripes were the stripes on his back. So and this is the eighteen eighties or something. So there we go. But then, I'm, don't get me on the subject of the Baltic Germans, because I'm, I'm, I've tried desperately for nearly a decade to try and be fair about them. But at the end of the day, I don't like them. And, uh, you know, and I think they did, they certainly did, some of them, there were decent ones, the Estophiles, you know, and as I say, they codified the language, they helped us to write down the oral tradition, and they helped us develop, a, you know, a, a, this great lyrical romantic tradition in, in, in literature. But, I mean, um, you know, that, that, was, that was only a very, very small part, of really a rather horrific picture, in my view. I rest my case. Okay, any more? <laughs> so I think we say a big thank you to...